Dr. Azrin Muhammad Azidin. Dr. Azrin is a consultant anesthesiologist in the Department of Anesthesia, Hospital Kuala Lumpur. So uh, he is uh, known as the guru for the regional anesthesia for Ministry of Health, if not for Malaysia. Uh, and she is, he is um, uh, also a, a well-known and very active member of the regional anesthesia special interest group uh, in the College of Anesthesiologists. And we've seen him very often uh, conducting workshops and webinars uh, for uh, College of Anesthetists. Yeah. And he also had, has authored and co-authored various papers and guidelines on anesthesia for robotic surgery, renal transplant, and various documents and studies on regional anesthesia. I would like now to invite our third speaker, and Dr. Azrin. And Dr. Azrin will be speaking on facial plane blocks, uh, temporal effects on persistent post-surgical pain. Uh, what do we know now? Uh, please welcome Dr. Azrin. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Uh, Thank you, uh, Prof, for the kind uh, introduction earlier. Uh, thank you to the organizers uh, who have invited me uh, as a panel for uh, today's session. Um, I'm sure that uh, many are familiar with uh, facial plane blocks that we have uh, in current practice. And I'm sure that many are aware of uh, its advantages. Uh, but today I will try and uh, bring uh, the issue of um, the temporal effects on persistent pain uh, with facial pain blocks and what do we know at the moment i'll be uh, this is the outline of my uh, session today i'll be giving uh, an overview of facial pain blocks and also uh, uh, its effect on um, persistent post-surgical pain and what we have learned so far and what are the evidence uh, that's uh, around in the in the in the journals and, and and at the end of the session i will summarize what's the uh, current understanding okay uh, the criteria for diagnosis of uh, persistent post-surgical pain was originally proposed by mccray and davis and uh, it was uh, proposed to be revised by werner and Kongsgaard in 2014 uh, but to put it simply uh, post, uh, persistent post-surgical pain is a new pain which did not exist before operative procedure lasting beyond three months after surgery in or around the area when all other um, uh, source of pain had been ruled out. So basically that's the, uh, what we understand by persistent post-surgical pain. And the incidence of uh, persistent post-surgical pain varies and are, are the highest amongst uh, amputation, uh, cholecystectomy, mastectomy, and also thoracotomy. But actually, it can occur uh, after any surgery, and there are various predisposing risk factors um, for uh, development of persistent post-surgical pain. And one of the risk factors is uh, the severity of um, acute post-operative pain. And it appears that uh, regional anesthetic techniques have a role in, in reducing that. This has been further corroborated uh, by the latest Cochrane review in 2018, which found that um, regional anesthesia techniques may reduce uh, persistent post-surgical pain between 3 to 18 months for thoracotomy and three to a year after LSCS, and these were given a moderate quality evidence. Um, RA techniques also uh, may reduce uh, persistent post-surgical pain at three months to a year after breast cancer surgery, uh, but were given a low quality evidence. And um, intravenous infusion of local anesthetics may reduce a persistent post-surgical pain uh, three to six months after breast cancer surgery with the moderate quality evidence. However, uh, these were weakened by the small size and number of studies. 
uh, by also performance bias, null bias, attrition, and missing data. And it was not really, uh, they were unable to extend uh, their conclusions to other surgical interventions and also uh, technique. However, when looking through the paper, all searches were done up to December 2016. And basically, there were old studies, and the latest were uh, search for was in 2016. And the RA interventions that were they were looking through were basically for uh, the ones for thoracic surgeries were actually um, epidural. It was about um, three to four out of seven uh, RCTs that they looked through. And for breasts, mostly were paravertebral blocks uh, in five of the 18 RCTs that they reviewed. And the latest one uh, was in 2016. They did not look at the only available PEX block trial at the time, which was from Hassan and colleagues in 2016. So we understand uh, over the last few years that there has been an explosion of facial plane blocks practices uh, first came uh, the PEX blocks in 2011, uh, serratus plane blocks 2013, uh, corretus lamborum block um, 2013, and the ESP uh, recently in 2016. And what we have seen so far has been prospective randomized control trials, uh, which were st only statistically powered to perioperatively assess short-term efficacy parameters. And these uh, uh, comparisons were done against um, gold standards um, or systemic analgesia here with uh, the control groups. And there were also some done uh, over active comparators. Uh, but besides efficacy parameters, the other, uh, they were looking also at safety parameters uh, in terms of complications like uh, uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity and also incidences of uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting. And at the most, also they looked at intermediate uh, term parameters such as length of hospital stay. But the effect of facial plane block on long-term benefits were scarcely reported. Um, looking through the evidence, we have, uh, we, have, uh, we are aware that um, facial plane blocks have been proven to be safe and technically easier over the established gold standard and also some active comparators. Uh, we have seen that uh, they have proven benefit over systemic controls. They have also uh, shown to be uh, effective um, um, with less complication. And the evidence on the effects are still accumulating at the moment. And there have been recent meta-analysis on PEX blocks, serratus plane blocks, and also uh, erectus spinae blocks. Um, PEX blocks, we have seen meta-analysis from 2017 uh, right, up, right uh, up to 2020. Serratus plane blocks uh, over the last uh, two years. And similarly, uh, in, with the erectus spinae plane blocks, we have seen uh, uh, meta-analysis over the last two years. And this is just a summary of, of um, the meta-analysis. Um, these were the first few meta-analyses that were conducted um, um, with regards to the effect of uh, serratus plane blocks. And these two basically uh, looked at um, um, the primary outcome, uh, pain scores, and also uh, morphine uh, opioid consumption over the first 24 hours. Uh, Chong looked at two groups, serratus plane blocks versus non-block care, and also looked at uh, serratus plane block versus uh, paravertebral blocks. Uh, while you look at uh, stratus plane blocks versus control. So basically, uh, the quality of evidence that they have uh, accumulated were uh, from low to moderate for Chong and also moderate to high uh, for Liu. Uh, basically, they have found that there's a reduced um, early post-operative vast cause versus non-block care uh, and also minimal differences versus peripheral blood uh, prefer, uh, paravertebral blocks, and they provide effective analgesia at all time points, reduce opioid consumption and side effects of PONV. Looking at uh, erectus spinae plane blocks, these are the first few uh, meta-analysis. 
and they've also looked at uh, the same parameters and they've come to the conclusion with the uh, uh, moderate quality of evidence uh, that ESP may have an effective, uh, maybe an effective analgesic strategy to minimize post operative pain and reduce opioid consumption. And with a high quality of evidence for uh, ESP in reducing PONV uh, incidences. Um, similarly to Huang, but uh, uh, the group did not mention the quality of evidence. But looking at facts, we have uh, quite a number of meta analysis uh, over the last few years uh, uh, from Versailles in 2017 uh, until uh, Grape in 2020 and Jean. Um, basically, uh, Versailles was uh, the, the first uh, um, and the first attempt of basically uh, looking at uh, facts blocks. They actually um, looked at uh, uh, quali qualitatively, they can't really uh, uh, came to the conclusion and they can't uh, provide any uh, analysis. And subsequently, uh, they looked at uh, uh, PECS versus control and also PECS versus paravertebral blocks. Uh, and later on, uh, Versailles uh, in 2019 um, also came up with an another meta analysis. Great and Jane looked at facts versus control, and they also had uh, analyzed uh, via a trial sequential analysis. With regards to persistent uh, post operative pain and facts blocks, um, this issue was addressed in three meta analysis uh, by Singh 2018. Uh, it was just listed as, uh, as a table of uh, included studies. Hussein uh, in 2019 actually uh, uh, just uh, did a descriptive um, discussion on, on one study, which is by Hassan. Uh, but uh, Hussein had a, dif a different definition of um, statistical analysis, and, uh, and they found that uh, it was the, the, the difference seen was not statistically significant. Uh, Great. Uh, looked at two uh, RCTs um, numbering 108 uh, patients by Al Jabari and Hassan. And in their uh, pool analysis, found that there's a difference between uh, PEX and control uh, uh, in terms of uh, incidence at six months, but were found to be uh, not significant. So basically, looking at that, what are the evidence that we are seeing at the moment? Um, this was one of the earliest um, studies on PECS and looking at persistent postoperative pain. It was by Hassan, uh, published in 2016. They enrolled uh, 60 patients randomly assigned to two groups, the uh, PECS group given saline and PECS given bupivacaine and dexmeritomidine. And the patients were assessed for acute pain, uh, intraoperatively, postoperatively. And the primary outcome was the chronic pain, need for analgesia, and patient satisfaction at one, three, and six months. And they found that uh, preemptive ultrasound guided PEX block controls acute postoperative pain and opioid consumption, resulting in re reduced chronic pain uh, incidences uh, later on at three and six months. So this was basically one, uh, the, 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 the first attempt of uh, um, assessing the efficacy of PEX blocks in uh, chronic pain. This is one uh, closer to home. Uh, this is uh, one of our, our master's trainees who actually uh, did a retrospective study on um, post mastectomy pain syndrome here in Hospital Kuala Lumpur. It was a cross sectional study. Uh, he looked at uh, 288 women who underwent uh, mastectomy and axillary clearance from June 2016 to 2017. It was retrospective review. 143 received PEX2 blocks 
145 conventional GA and systemic analgesic. And the outcome was uh, looking at site of pain, pain scores, analgesic consumption and symptoms of post mastectomy pain syndrome. And they found uh, that there was statistically significant lower incidence of uh, post mastectomy pain syndrome in PEX2 group uh, compared with conventional GA and systemic analgesics. Um, they also found uh, PEX2 also reported lower pain scores at operative site, uh, lesser use of analgesics, and low incidence of pain to non-noxious stimuli. Um, so basically, uh, the conclusion was that PEX2 block for patients undergoing MAC reduces the incidence and severity of post mastectomy pain syndrome. This is another recent one. Uh, this is the uh, by Dikasai. Uh, PEX2 block is associated with lower incidence of chronic pain after breast surgery. This was a prospective monocentric observational study uh, looking at 140 consecutive patients within that uh, observational period. Uh, 49 patients had PEX uh, as an analgesic modality versus GA and um, standard analgesics. And the parameters observed were intraoperative variables, postoperative data, including pain over the first 24 hours, and the need for additional analgesic administration. And development and persistence of chronic pain were the primary outcome. And they found that PEX2 block could be able to prevent chronic pain after breast surgery at three months. Uh, they, they found that there's a statistical significance at three months, but it was not significant um, at other time points up to a year. Um, later, uh, the Kasai uh, went on the same uh, uh, data and, and basically because of the inhomogeneous nature of the study sample, uh, because it was observational and non-randomized, uh, they went on and did a propensity scoring of the study, and it still revealed a statistically significant result. Uh, it was because the there were the numbers of samples collected were not the same, so they can't really be uh, uh, analyzed uh, conventionally, and they did the propensity scoring whereby they actually try and comp made comparable the two groups and even uh, when they analyzed it still uh, revealed a statistically significant result. Um, Fuji also did a randomized control trial of PEX block versus serratus pain block for chronic pain after mastectomy and uh, this was called the breast trial which is block reducing pain after surgery trial. Uh, it was a prospective single center, 80 patients for mastectomy, and both groups were compared uh, with, uh, were given uh, either PEX blocks or serratus pain block. And the primary outcome was rate of pain worse than mild at six months. And the other outcome measured were rate of pain free, the health quality, health related quality of life, at six months, and also morphine consumption and pain scores at 24 hours. And what they found, there was a statistically significant reduction in the rate of moderate to severe pain patients at six months, and also the acute outcome whereby there's a statistically significant uh, reduction in morphine consumption over 24 hours. And Using a subgroup uh, analysis, uh, they looked at patients with uh, axillary clearance. And for PEX block, they had 14 patients who had axillary, uh, axillary lymph node dissection, uh, whereby 16 with the serratus pain block. And they found that there were a larger proportion of patients who were without pain with PEX block rather than serratus pain block. And it was uh, adjusted to uh, uh, post mastectomy radiation therapy using multiple logistic regression analysis, and they found there was a statistically significant difference 
between these two techniques. And their conclusion was that the PECs may be able to reduce chronic pain six months after mastectomy in terms of reducing rate of patients having moderate to severe pain and also increased rates of patients who are pain-free with reduced severity. So going away from uh, breast surgeries, there's also, uh, this is one of the uh, first few studies that look, looked at chronic uh, post-surgical pain uh, in patients undergoing hip fracture repair. This is also quite a, a recent article. Uh, looking at the impact of facial iliaca compartment block on patients undergoing hip fracture repair in Greece. Uh, in this study, uh, it was a prospective randomized study, 182 patients for hip fracture surgery. Patients were given either a facial iliaca compartment block versus a M block. The primary outcome was uh, looking at characteristic pain intensity at three months, presence and severity of hip-related pain at three to six months, um, uh, pain scores at six, 24, 36, and 48 post-op hours, uh, and looking at uh, 24 hours tramadol PCA administration and timing of the first tramadol dose. So they, these were the outcomes that they were, they were looking at. And they found facial iliaca block may reduce the incidence, intensity, and severity of chronic post-surgical pain at three and six months after hip fracture surgery and uh, providing safe and effective post-operative analgesia. So in, in summary, uh, although not much is conclusive, conclusively known as of now uh, with regards to the effect of facial pain blocks on persistent pain. Uh, there are a few positive results that we can see from the isolated trials. Uh, although it was a very low to low quality evidence, um, we can see some of the effects of PEX block for breast surgery, uh, facial iliaca compartment blocks for hip surgery, and also TEP block for abdominal surgery. Um, but particularly PEX block uh, due to its effect on the axilla uh, dissection. Uh, and looking at the study uh, by Fuji that uh, actually compared uh, PEX with surgical plane. So looking at that, it seems that uh, PEX may have a role in, in, in uh, uh, providing post-operative pain relief um, up to the point of reducing the severity and incidence of chronic pain. But looking, looking back at all the other papers, uh, all the other results, although not found to be statistically significant, we can, we can see that there's clearly observed differences in incidence rates up to threefold uh, versus control at other time points. This is uh, in the Kasai's paper, which was, uh, there were only significant difference seen at three months. But the rest of the incidences, we can actually see there was an obvious difference. And another in Fuji's paper, there were also two to three fold differences in proportions of patients with uh, moderate to severe pain and also those without uh, having pain at uh, six months. And even the two pool uh, analysis by Greg look at a difference. Uh, quite a large difference, uh, with 15% difference of uh, PEX versus control rates at six months. Although it was not found to be statistically significant, uh, the number was actually quite, uh, apparently quite big uh, a difference uh, looking at all the other numbers. So now we are actually considering whether there's any clinical significance rather than looking at statistical significance. So I guess this is an area where we can actually look at and, and, uh, and change our focus to. Um, more studies are prospectively looking into long-term effects of facial pain blocks at the moment. Uh, we, we see more of health-related quality of life and persistent pain as the parameter that uh, to be looked at. And two of such examples are 
um, these two studies, uh, acute and chronic post mastectomy pain can pex block alter the geography. And this is expected to finish by December 2023. And the other one is the impact of pex blocks on post mastectomy pain syndrome, uh, which is expected to finish by next year. So uh, I hope that we know more within the next few years and see uh, a shift in focus of, of doing uh, prospective uh, RCTs now towards uh, looking at chronic pain or persistent post-surgical pain as their primary outcome. So I guess uh, with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Azrin, for that comprehensive talk on uh, an update on uh, interfacial uh, nerve blocks. Uh, I have a couple of questions here from the participant for you. Uh, question number one is, uh, would you say that with the evidence available, PECS and ESP should now be our standard of care for major breast cancer surgery? Okay, I think... Um... Uh, actually, Prospect Group has came out with the recommendations uh, earlier this year, and they have recommended that uh, paravertebral blocks as the first line for major breast surgery. And, and ESP uh, is currently not recommended because of uh, there's uh, limited evidence. But I guess looking at what um, there's another uh, group that is looking into this. Um, this, this issue as well is a, a group from Switzerland. They are also came, they came out with uh, their own recommendations based on a meta-analysis and a trial sequential analysis that they did. And they found that uh, PEX has better impact in terms of um, um, efficacy parameters, uh, for example, pain scores and morphine requirements. And they found that uh, based on their analysis, it is of a higher quality of evidence based on para uh, compared to paravertebral blocks. So I personally, I feel that PECS may have a role um, because of the, the uh, actually uh, one of the uh, um, outcome from Fuji's paper was that they found that axilla is, is, is one of the uh, more common sites of um, uh, chronic pain. And understanding the PECS effect on the axilla compartment, then uh, personally, I feel that PEX may be um, technically easier and has similar efficacy than paravertebral blocks for, for breast surgery. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. And uh, we have one more question from Dr. Sharidan Fatil. Uh, the question is, uh, are you ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia or POCUS now part of the core competencies of the new anesthesiologist in Malaysia? Um, I, I, I think at the moment, it, it is still not made uh, compulsory as a core competency, but we are moving towards that in terms of training and encouraging uh, trainees to uh, be familiar with ultrasound in the first place and also uh, progressing from there. Uh, for example, uh, doing more of the uh, ultrasound guided techniques in terms of blocks or, or vascular access and we encourage our trainees to uh, uh, go into uh, um, focus um, enhance their knowledge and experience in focus as well so uh, as as far as i'm aware we are not uh, uh, compulsorily making this a core as a core competency probably in the future uh, we, we, we may move towards that but at the moment we are, we are encouraging so I suppose uh, uh, pain management has uh, suffered from actually two main uh, sort of pandemic. One is the opioid crisis and the other one is the COVID-19. So can uh, any of the panelists comment if there's any change in the practice of uh, pain uh, due to this uh, Opioid crisis and COVID nineteen. 
Azrin can talk about, uh, have you all changed your techniques for acute pain management and regional anesthesia doing more or less uh, in this COVID-19 time? Maybe first we start with that. Okay, uh, I think um, we have seen over the last two years from, from our registry that we have, uh, in, there's, there's some increase in the, the numbers of blocks that we do, um, especially in HKL. And we are reaching more um, more of the energetic blocks rather than the anesthetic blocks. So we are doing more of these interfacial pain blocks. And we are also reaching out to uh, patients who are with, um, besides uh, post-surgical uh, issues uh, for pain, also we're looking at uh, patients who are uh, being referred for rehab uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, knee post-knee surgeries, so we, we are looking at that aspects and we are uh, we are actually uh, in collaboration with the surgeons to to tailor what the patient's uh, requirement are so that we can actually adjust um, the technique that we are using whether we, we, we can use a, a lower concentration uh, of uh, local anesthetics and uh, whether uh, we need to use boluses more or uh, just infusion uh, basically so we are actually moving towards that and, and looking at the, the rehab, uh, rehab uh, part of, of um, uh, post-surgical care uh, besides looking at uh, uh, um, just managing acute uh, pain. So basically those are the, the, the two areas that we are looking at. And uh, I think the, the, the collaboration with the surgeons now are better and in, in, in the sense that they are, they are understanding, us, understanding us a bit more uh basically is 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 uh knowing what the other needs and what the other can give so i think we are moving towards that dr azrin now that you have mentioned surgeons participation i know some surgeon actively doing tap block uh, what is your comment on that um is 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 uh it's, it's not an, a, a hindrance to us, uh, just that uh, whether they look back at their results or not, um, whether the patients have good outcome with that, uh, not saying that we are the ones who can do blocks uh, or, or give uh, local anesthetics uh, there, just that um, personally, I feel that block is something that, that is uh, technically difficult to correlate with the outcome. Uh, possibly the surgeon's infiltration of the tap probably uh, under direct vision is better than our own ultrasound guided techniques. Uh, we don't know because we, 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 we haven't uh, seen the, the, the difference and the results. So I guess uh, if, the patient, if the surgeons come to us and say that uh, it's okay, we can infiltrate, and I guess probably it is better at the end of the day for the patient because they are being administered local anesthetic directly to the point uh, under vision. So I guess it is more precise than, than us. So I would encourage surgeons to give blocks, but not just local infiltration. It, it has to be done at the proper plane uh, uh, in the correct uh, uh, doses, the correct techniques uh, so that uh, we can see the, the, the outcome better in that sense. 